back a year ago. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Beer Bound podcast. In today's episode, we're delighted to be joined by Michelle Janikian, born in New York City and raised in New Jersey. Michelle studied writing and psychology at Sarah Lawrence College before traveling extensively in Latin America and eventually settling down in southern Mexico. Michelle is a journalist and an author of your psilocybin mushroom companion, the down-to-earth guide that details everything you need to know about taking magic mushrooms safely and mindfully. Michelle actively covers psychedelic and cannabis education, harm reduction, and research in her work, which has been featured in Playboy, Rolling Stone, High Times, Double Blind Mag, Psychedelics Today, and others. She's passionate about the healing potential of psychedelic plants and substances, and the legalization and destigmatization of all drugs. In our pursuit to learn more about interesting substances in this world beyond our love of beer, we are excited to speak to Michelle and learn more about her expertise and knowledge in the complex landscape of psychedelics, cannabis, and beyond. So, Michelle, without further ado, we welcome you to the Beer Bound Podcast. How are you doing? Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm doing great. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm okay. Okay. I'm excited to speak to you and learn a little bit more. So maybe I just scratched the surface, but can you delve a little bit further into you, your experience with psychedelics, with cannabis? The floor is yours. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, I wrote this book, Your Psilocybin Mushroom Companion, because I had been reporting on the cannabis and psychedelic space for a few years, starting mostly in cannabis, um, and then just getting a lot of interest, you know, back what, 2017, uh, 18, uh, in more like psychedelic work. Um, and that was when it was really becoming like this big thing with Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind, which was a big book and now a Netflix series. There was just a lot of interest and I was experienced and it just like kind of happened. But yeah, I've been a cannabis and psychedelics consumer since. I was a teenager um, and didn't really know when I got into it. You know, this is like in the early 2000s. It wasn't really this culture yet of like that I knew about anyway. It was kind of underground, like safe use, intentional use. Um, that like cannabis wasn't this terrible thing that was going to rot my brain and make me lazy, like all these things. And then um, once I finished college and, you know, tried to pursue writing as a career, uh, this all happened very like organically and it was really exciting and and legalization was happening in Canada and the US and and so yeah it was a really exciting time to um, kind of like take my what I thought was this bad thing that I was doing and bring it into the light and like it kind of like um, at, at, like at the same time I was like very public like looking at my own stuff and realizing like what was stigma and like lessons from dare in my childhood and and you know what is safe use what is responsible like adult use and all these kinds of things and so here I am uh yeah that's a short answer I guess <laughs> yeah definitely I this for us it's kind of interesting this is sort of a two-part this is the second part of our hopes to educate ourselves a little bit more because we actually interviewed a few weeks ago a woman by the name of Amanda Siebert I'm not sure if you're familiar with her I have heard of her yeah yeah she wrote um, a book the little book of cannabis how marijuana can improve your life and then she also published a book called psyched seven cutting edge psychedelics changing the world she published that last year so anyway so we interviewed her and we learned a little bit but we barely scratched the surface on what psychedelics are um, a little bit. I mean, I'm pretty ignorant even on cannabis, even though it is now a legal substance in my country. But uh, can you start us off maybe, uh, maybe start us off with magic mushrooms. What are magic mushrooms? Yeah, so magic mushrooms uh, refer to a type of mushroom that contains psilocybin, which is like the chemical that makes you have a psychedelic trip. 
And so sometimes they're referred to as psilocybin mushrooms. Sometimes you hear just psilocybin tossed around, which is really new. It was really funny. I feel like everyone just learned how to pronounce this word like in the last five years, right? Like, <laughs> um, but so essentially there are like 180 different species of mushrooms that contain psilocybin. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, when you eat them, they cause a psychedelic experience. They're not poisonous. You know, this isn't like you're poisoning yourself and surviving. I feel like that's a, a rumor that gets tossed around and like, no, psilocybin is actually a really safe substance. Like if we're talking about substances, if you look at the data, there's some organization that looked at like the harmfulness of every drug, um, according to like, I think it's like emergency room, like admissions and things like that. And cannabis and psilocybin are two of the safest substances. It's, you know, it's, it sends the least amount of people to the hospital. They are pretty easy on your body compared to other psychedelics or other substances in general. They're both natural, right? They're found um, in nature. So it's not like a chemical synthetic thing, although I'm not one of these psychedelic people who is again synthetics. Um, <laughs> but it, I mean, we could talk about the experience. So if you eat mushrooms, you know, there's all these different like doses you can take and they all kind of have different experiences. So what's kind of this new thing that's in the news a lot is microdosing, which is these very, very small doses that you barely feel it, but people are reporting like a lot of benefits, feeling more open, less depressed, lots of things. We can go into that. And then, you know, there's bigger doses, which are essentially stronger. It's a stronger experience, like a full tripping dose um, is a pretty powerful experience, which is why I wrote the book, because it is a really deep thing. And, you know, if you do it just kind of like spontaneously in a, if you're in public or whatever, it can be like a pretty bad trip. I think that's where a lot of the bad trip stories come from. But if you prepare yourself and you're in a really tranquil environment and, you know, with really close friends and just really peaceful and you prepare a little bit, it can be a really powerful, beautiful thing that some folks are finding really therapeutic, which is this whole other world of like mushrooms for therapy and depression. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to it. it. It can be this kind of like fun substance, sort of. Uh, it's arguable. We could talk about that too. The experience can be fun. It can be kind of hard. It can be a little crazy, a little feels like kind of overwhelming sometimes. Um, and, you know, there are folks who do it with their friends to connect or just have a kind of like fun, different experience. Camping's a really like safe place. Folks like to do it out in the woods. You feel really connected to nature. Um, yeah. So there's like, there's all these different camps of it essentially. And I'm not here to say one's any better than the other, just that you should do a little homework before you get into it. Cause it, it can be heavy and, um, and pick the experience that really feels right to you. Yeah, M Michelle, who would you recommend should try psilocybin magic <laughs> mushrooms? Should it be everybody? Are there some folks potentially who are a little bit more on the nervous or perhaps neurotic side of things? Folks who have a bit higher levels of anxiety, maybe that you would recommend, eh, maybe microdosing would be better or maybe staying away from it altogether. Or do you think that the benefits potentially in terms of recreation, as well as potentially in medicinal ways, folks who want to explore and experiment with learning a little bit more about who they are, who should do magic mushrooms and who shouldn't? Well, yeah, that's the kind of question that I tend to um, evade a little bit, only because I really don't have a strong opinion on that because I'm not a doctor. There are some strong opinions on this out there. Um, however, I'm kind of a highly strong, nervous person and I still really get a lot of benefit from it. That's why I really like to prepare and kind of wrote the book. It was kind of for like the high, strong, nervous people like me, you know, like that doesn't mean that we can't do this. I think it means that we should just like prepare ourselves kind of like how really nervous people tend to prepare themselves for everything, you know, we're like kind of in our heads like that, but 
there's definitely like if you're worried there there is some research that you can look into i have a whole chapter in the book on contraindications which is like the medical word for like who should maybe avoid this and there's definitely some stuff out there especially if um you do have like some mental health issues or concerns and you're on medication for those concerns. And then this does get, and you want to do this for healing. Then this all does get a little bit more serious and you definitely want to do a little bit more research, read my book, read Amanda's book, you know, maybe even try to talk to some kind of doctor or something about this. But when it comes to like this, your physical health, it's really quite safe for most folks unless you have like a heart problem, perhaps epilepsy, those kinds of things. You might want to be extra careful. But I mean, in terms of the benefits, like as someone who is quite anxious and high strung um, and like I've dealt with depression in my life, you know, um, in like phases, it can really like a, a big mushroom trip that I'm like prepared for and that's like really comfortable and everything's really um just nice and tranquil um has really helped me to like accept myself and come to terms with a lot of things that were hard to see in my sober everyday reality you get kind of like a bird's eye view of your life sometimes on a big dose of mushrooms and and that can be a little hard, right? Which is why I say sometimes it can be a little scary. Sometimes you don't really want to see yourself in the mirror like that way, you know, but I do think it's beneficial. And that's why part of prepping could be kind of going into this with the mindset that you're here to like accept any part of you that comes up, right? Instead of sometimes I think when folks go in just for fun and it ends up being really emotional, like they're disappointed or something. So you know, I do recommend if this is something you're thinking of doing to learn about yourself or to try to get over some of your anxiety or depression, um, to really like prepare your mind for that and and to be really open during the experience to any kinds of feelings or memories or hallucinations that come up because if you fight them, it's a lot harder, but if you kind of accept them and show them like love and compassion and understanding, you can come out feeling like a lot better and like you have closure and like things make a lot more sense and they don't hold you back as much, but that's hard to do. And I think that's why these therapy and coaches and these kinds of like, or shamans and these kinds of like guides are kind of popular in this space as well. But you know, that's not for everyone also. So I, that's why I wrote the book too. <laughs> Sorry to keep coming back, but uh, I kind of lay it out. Each chapter is kind of like, just explains this kind of thing without really telling people what to do. And so that you can kind of see like what psychedelic um, people have been doing, and then you can kind of pick your own um, experience and, and, and plan your own like perfect way to have this big experience. So knowing a little bit about beer, I'm a bit of a history nerd. So cool. we, we like to study some history surrounding beer and we kind of know a little bit about it, but not so much because beer probably predates any written documentation we have as a species. So that makes That's it so a little cool. complicated to really <laughs> pinpoint exactly where it came from or how long we've been drinking. Now, mushrooms seems interesting to me because beer is very simple, like it's a simple process, but... It still does require a few different ingredients that you have to put together in order to make it. Not that many, um, basically just water and a malt and a natural form of yeast. And there you go, you have beer. Now we put hops in it, but you don't have to. So mushrooms are just, they're just there. Like you don't have to create them. So do we have any sense? I mean, we know that we've been drinking alcoholic beverages like wine and beer for at least thousands of years. Do we have any context on exactly where these different forms of magic mushrooms come from and for how long have we been consuming them and using them maybe recreationally or for other purposes? Yeah. So I'm not a historian, but I do know a little bit about this stuff. So I'll try my best, but essentially folks have been eating mushrooms for thousands of years as well. And I think and so I'm here in Mexico and one of the the surviving people who still use psilocybin containing mushrooms um, for like healing and ceremony and spirituality, like 
a divination, they call it, still exists here in the mountains of Oaxaca and some other regions in, in Mexico. The Mazatec people in Huatla de Jimenez are still very actively, this is a very deep part of their culture. It's not some like druggy thing. It's like a very spiritual thing. I've been up there. It's really magical. It's really cool. Um, but, you know, they since colonialism here, so like over 500 years ago when the Spanish came here, they wiped a lot of this kind of stuff out because it was not, didn't go along with like their Catholic Christian beliefs. And so it was like the devil, you know, like this stuff is like very much like nature has spirits and and this very like, you know, just not very Christian way of looking at the world. And so a lot of this stuff is gone now. Um, and so I think there's a lot of belief in this kind of like um, psychedelic history community that believe that, especially in Latin America, because there's so many psilocybin mushrooms that grow here just naturally in the mountains, that it's been going on for thousands of years, uh, potentially. Um, and there's all these like mushroom stones that are found here. Um, Paul Stamets, who's this famous mushroom guy, he's really into collecting them. He's like bought a few. They're like very expensive, like um, archaeological like uh, artifacts. <laughs> um, and they're found in Guatemala and Mexico near like sacred sites and stuff and down into Colombia. And so yeah, I think and there's arguments also to be made for like European use of psychedelic mushrooms also kind of like over a thousand, two thousand years ago, the a different kind of mushroom that has a psychedelic effect, the Amanita muscaria, the red ones with the white dots, those are not psilocybin. The chemical in those that makes you have a psychedelic experience is called muscamol, I think. But there's evidence that uh, shamans in Siberia have been using them for like thousands of years. That one's a little bit more dangerous. It needs like some preparation. You can't just eat that and trip. Um, yeah. Kind of more similar to beer, like folks thousands of years ago had to figure out how to make this kind of dangerous substance into a spiritual substance, which I think is really cool. Um, so yeah, there, and there's probably more, it's just kind of been wiped out, I think with Christianity, like the history of this kind of stuff. And so it's been really exciting to, for folks to keep learning about it. And these kinds of publications have been coming out and yeah, there's definitely a big history here. Yeah. No kidding. We, we talked to, <laughs> um, Amanda a little bit about this in terms of its reputation and it's the stigma surrounding a substance like mushrooms you mentioned something interesting that I'm sure has a lot to do with it sort of the sense of of colonialism that exists in North and South America but all over the world of course and maybe it not adhering to traditional of traditions of European conquerors and maybe that's a reason why these substances have been stamped out culturally around the world. I don't really know. It's kind of interesting to me why some substances like alcohol, which is extremely toxic and poisonous and accounts and is associated with spousal abuse and drunk driving and lots of deaths in, yeah, in liver countless and ways. Yeah, yeah not failure. I know. Not to mention know. its actual health. Uh, the atrocious health consequences that are attached to it. So why? Yeah, like I, I'm, I'm really curious. Like even Canada now is one of the only countries that has legalized cannabis, which I think is interesting too. Why more countries haven't done that? I know that some states in the United States have, but federally it's not. I, I don't think I don't even know if any states in Mexico have gone as far to legalize cannabis. It doesn't work like that in Mexico. They have to have the whole country like America is kind of unique in that way where they've been able to do it state by state. However, Mexico is in the process of legalizing weed, but I think it's never going to be an industry like it is in Canada and America. It's just different here. But you're right. I mean, this is really interesting. And, and and it's a big part of, I think, this like psychedelic cannabis renaissance is like really, if we're really honest, these things are healthier. They're less harmful than alcohol. Yet the experience they give can be bigger, like a little bit. It's like a little bit different. Like it can be a little bit more overwhelming, even though like getting really drunk is definitely like a whole thing. We all kind of know <laughs> But 
I think that it's scared. I think it's scared folks the way that mushrooms and cannabis make people act. I think it's been like, yeah, definitely a big part of like colonialism and just kind of like a European fear of native people and, and with cannabis, like slavery, like it was slaves who were the ones who were um, like taking the hemp plant that they were supposed to grow for like making sales and stuff and we're cultivating it into like nugs for smoking and stuff, you know, probably figuring out that the female plants like created this other uh, type of flower that was like medicine, essentially. Um, yeah, you know, even it goes back to like, Greek and Roman times, like when the Romans came in and like kind of pushed Christianity on Greece, like a lot of their sacred ceremonies that it's been argued like the Illusion Mysteries were using, maybe ergot beer, which would be like an LSD beer, or maybe it was mushrooms or and and really they think it was like yeah the romans who were newly christian were like no this does not fit into like our idea of how like a civilized world should act it's kind of interesting and it's kind of funny that we're going back in a way not that i think it's uncivilized at all i think it's something we've been depriving culture of um personally for the last like who knows hundreds of years personally <laughs> yeah yeah i do i find it I find it odd at, at a substance like magic mushrooms that I think taken in a North American context, I think a lot of people know about this particular substance. Maybe they don't know a lot about it, but they, they think maybe, oh, it's for folks who want to do for hippies or whatever. Yeah, maybe, yeah maybe. I don't know. Something like yeah. that. Because it was in America and in, in Canada, I imagine, in the 60s when it was like a big Thing for the first time right and so that's part of the history of mushrooms as well is um in the 50s this banker called um r gordon watson who was like a, a mycophile you know he loved mushrooms and so did his wife Her name is valentina something i forget she was Russian. So they were of different cultures and they got married and Russians as a Russian, she grew up like picking, she knew how to identify edible mushrooms. And as an American, he was like, you're going to die. Do not eat those mushrooms on their honeymoon, like in the Catskill mountains of New York, I think. And it started this kind of like lifelong passion for them in their like free time. They were like mushroom enthusiasts. And in the fifties, no one was really aware that you will, okay, white Americans in Europe didn't know that Mexicans were, there were Mexican people, um, like indigenous people still using psilocybin mushrooms until he went to Wautla. And he's the one who discovered Maria Sabina. That's that famous um, Mazatec shaman woman who, I don't know, in Mexico, there's like posters of her everywhere smoking this like big cigar. And like, she's a very like iconic figure here. And he wrote an article about her and this velada, like a ceremony she had for him um, in the 50s in Life magazine, which back then everyone was like reading Life magazine. There was no internet. There was, you know, like that was how you got your entertainment, like every Saturday or whatever. And so when that article hit newsstands, like that was kind of, it was like mid 50s, like maybe 57, something like that. And that kind of started a lot of folks, especially from the US and Canada, like, going down to Mexico and wanting to have this big experience and the hippie movement is all very happening kind of like at the same time and LSD becomes this big thing like 10 years later and and I think that's kind of where the part of the stigma against psychedelics comes from is this time um which is kind of interesting even though I think the 60s did a lot of good for social progress and yet we're still kind of like oh no, like, don't do that hippie thing and drop out of your life. And like, I don't know. And people are still associating magic mushrooms and other psychedelics with that whole mood, like that whole kind of negative way of looking at young people in the 60s. It's kind of interesting, kind of doesn't make any sense sometimes, but that's the way like culture works. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Is it like in contemporary, like with traditional indigenous folks in Mexico having that connection to psilocybin mushrooms does that still exist like take a country like Mexico a country that you're familiar with that you currently reside in that you know the culture I suspect and is it still you mentioned that cannabis isn't culturally woven into the fabric of Mexico like it might be in Canada or, or certain states of the United States but what about mushrooms 
Well, I would say they both are very much woven into the culture here. They're just not legal. But legality here, I don't know. Not that it's different, but right. like a little. People are like they still use cannabis, you know, like cannabis is a very big part of Mexican culture and and mushrooms too. Well, Mexican culture also just has so many it's so diverse too. So like even though mushrooms are really spiritual to certain indigenous groups to the average like mexican like middle class who doesn't identify as indigenous but mestizo like a mix um mushrooms are still a very highly stigmatized um and it is very much like oh my god you're gonna go crazy like don't do that and people are really afraid of them actually like even a lot of my friends here they've only microdosed like they're afraid of tripping fully because they have heard these crazy stories and and culturally it's still very stigmatized however there's also a whole generation of like people you know in their 20s and 30s and 40s who are like really into the mexican side trance scene and all this other kind of stuff and there is a big psychedelic culture here that isn't spiritual or indigenous that's just like young people having fun at the rave and stuff like there's everything um but it it is different than in America and Canada, but America and Canada have a really big influence on Mexico because we're neighbors. And like since California legalized adult use cannabis, the attitude in Mexico has changed very quickly, actually. Like, or it, it like it, it's it's starting to people are starting to come around, I think, since then, since you could just walk across the border in Tijuana, San Diego and go buy like THC oil for your, you know, grandma with some kind of problem and come back with it hidden in your suitcase. And like and there was a lot of news stories about that when can when California first legalized and um and the attitude here is it's it's very much like a very big medicinal culture here for cannabis right now and i think psychedelics are close behind um it definitely exists like i've gone to some ayahuasca ceremonies and stuff here and you know but it's not yet this like very kind of like in the news as a therapeutic you know miracle cure like it has been lately in america and canada are you, to your understanding, Michelle, are there any countries in the world that look, maybe not in terms of legalization, but look to a substance like psilocybin, magic mushrooms, maybe with a lens of a little less criminality, maybe decriminalized? Do we know of any countries like that? Um, the only one I can think of is the Netherlands, but it's kind of complicated there as well, where it's like not all mushrooms are legal there, but... There's some weird little loophole where the truffles can be sold at the coffee shops over there. But I don't think it's like culturally like, uh, I don't know. I think it's this like weird legal loophole that's mostly for tourists, essentially. Right. I think America and Canada are kind of at the forefront of changing yeah. these things. But I think it has to be America because essentially the only reason most countries made psilocybin like a class A substance was when America um, put the Controlled Substances Act through and then they kind of like forced the UN to like make all these other countries do that. So it, and then everyone was afraid to not do it because America would like take their aid and, and like help and like military support and stuff away. So it has to be America who does it first. So everyone else, like the dominoes will fall after. Um, it's basically just a new type of imperialism. But you know, it is changing at least. So <laughs> Right. I do think it's funny. I, we try not to get too political in this show as much <laughs> as possible, but like it taking your country into consideration, like I would say folks maybe who are behind legislation or, or lobbies that prevent any sort of dialogue to occur in terms of legalization or decriminalization for a substance like magic mushrooms would be more of a Republican side base i would assume the the conservative side would be more against magic mushrooms but it's a little bit strange to me because you take though it seems to me that also conservative america are sort of leaning more towards a libertarian lifestyle and if you're libertarian then you're like take the mushrooms i don't care just leave me alone you know so it kind of 
seems a little odd to me. It doesn't really make sense. But again, I'm not American, so I can't really comment. You know, I haven't lived in America in like a decade either. So it is hard, but it, it doesn't make any sense. You're right. <laughs> I think the right... I think everyone's a walking contradiction. We're all humans. It's like kind of part of the human experience. But yeah, you would think with all this kind of like, give me my freedoms, that all drugs would be legal. But it's also this kind of more conservative cultural attitude where they want things to be like really nice and neat and like drugs don't fit into that like way that they see their perfect world at the same time yeah alcohol still does so like nothing actually makes sense so it's a cool time to be alive and to just be talking about this stuff publicly right and and to be a reporter in that space because I think people are finally starting to open their eyes about this stuff and see it for less of like what the man wanted you to think in the 70s or whatever to more of like what's the truth like what's actually makes logical sense um we're close we're not there yet but we're getting a little bit closer to logic it's exciting (laughs) definitely I think you're right Michelle in terms of the dialogue like you can talk about these substances now and no one really judges you but 10 years ago I don't think it we were in the same social climate as we are now like it seems like I guess that leads me to my next question of like psilocybin psychedelics they're very hot subjects right now they're very kind of in vogue if I can say in western culture at least definitely in countries like the United States so why is that why in the last maybe I don't know I would wager maybe the last five years like psychedelics are kind of way more open to discussion. It's interesting, you mentioned countries like the Netherlands. Canada is similar in a way that we have, and we have these shops that open around in urban centers. Like in Toronto, we have these magic mushroom shops that open up and they sell magic mushroom chocolates and magic mushrooms. And then the police come maybe once a month and they shut them down and they pay a fine and then they open back up the next day. So it's Mm -hmm. like, it's... It's not legal by any means. It's not decriminalized, but I mean, it's kind of it's ridiculous. Anyway. That, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like I could walk a few blocks away and, and get some magic mushrooms and no one's stopping me. So, so anyways, my question is why now, why the last few years, why is, why are magic mushrooms, why is psilocybin psychedelics so in vogue? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if I have the answer, but in my opinion, I think cannabis legalization opened up a lot of doors. People were kind of changing their minds and that mushrooms were like kind of a logical next step. And I'd be curious to see if we have next steps after this. Um, But that's like maybe a conversation for another day. But I think, yeah, partly it's kind of like Canada and the U.S., like adult use legalizing weed. And then... I think COVID and being stuck inside and also this kind of like we're at a time of like reckoning culturally with, you know, how we think about like me too and the race riots in America during COVID, like how we think about marginalized people and trying to like really change, like at least the left is trying to like give people more agency and give people more power and have there be a little bit less sexism, racism, transphobia. And they think psychedelics like fit into that kind of like they did in the 60s revolution. Like people are opening their minds and seeing beyond what like the cultural narrative told them was correct. Um, And especially being home and stuck inside for those like one to two years during the height of COVID, like before the vaccination, that like that year where everyone was like really stuck inside. And like, I think doing a lot of like depressed self-reflection and a little bit of experimenting some folks with mushrooms and it was in the news and people were trying to get their hands on them. And I think it's all connected. I don't have like an exact answer, but I think all these things kind of led to it um, in a way. Do you know, Michelle, the, the main differences between, I believe you mentioned how many different types of psilocybin mushrooms exist and they exist on different continents And obviously we're talking a little bit more of the Americas, North and South America, but you mentioned that there are, there are mushrooms in Africa and in Asia. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely psilocybin mushrooms that grow. I think they grow on every continent except Antarctica, (laughs) 
Um, I don't know that much about the mushrooms in Africa, but I'm pretty sure they there have been some found there. And then definitely in Asia, like there's some strains of psilocybin mushrooms. There's some strains of psilocybe cubensis from like Cambodia and stuff. I mean, essentially, if there's like water <laughs> you know like if there's a place that it rains like mushrooms are gonna grow there you know like England has a lot they have this other kind liberty caps I forget the scientific name but I feel like in the culture over my husband's English and and all of his friends like when I go over there they're like oh yeah like when we were teenagers we went to this park and we just picked liberty caps and it was like very much part of their culture like the 90s early 2000s and um, and it still is, you know, I think America and I'm not sure about Canada, you know, I don't I haven't spent a lot of time there, but America still has this like rather puritanical view of substances that actually isn't uh, the same across Europe. You know, it's people, every country kind of has different attitudes towards you know, altering their consciousness essentially and the drugs that are accepted and and yeah, America happens to be like rather straight laced and closed minded. Um, and we can be a bit like, oh, like uppity about drugs uh, that is not necessarily shared by even all Westerners. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Michelle, what, what are the differences that exist between psilocybin mushrooms and other psychedelics? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so psilocybin mushrooms does have their own like particular experience um you know it has a, a length it kind of has like a whole story arc you know there's like a come up there's like a peak and there's a long kind of like decrescendo um and most psychedelics actually work in that way but they can have very different experiences I would say the most similar to the mushroom trip experience is LSD um, LSD is longer though. Um, there's a lot, and you know, every individual experiences them a little different. So for me, it's like, well, LSD is more geometrical in the visual, but like not everyone experiences that. Um, for me also, like mushrooms are very emotional and personal where LSD isn't always like it can be, but for me, like mushrooms can be very deep um they're also a little bit harder to predict like what the experience will be like where lsd is a little bit more like similar every time in a way but i think that has to do with just like the chemical composition of every individual mushroom and they even have their own kind of entourage effect like we talk about with cannabis and all the different terpenes and how it all interacts in your body but then there's all these other psychedelics too which just they each have their own distinct internal experience um but one thing that psychedelics tend to do no matter if it's like ketamine or shrooms or ayahuasca is kind of like it changes your mindset and you see things differently like whether or not that's better or worse or bigger or smaller or healing or not they they definitely just like change your perception for you know anywhere from like 4 to 12 16 hours depending on the substance and and i think that's the root of how they're like spiritual and therapeutic cuz some people get really stuck in their head and stuck in these ruts and now we know that there are these substances that can get you out of that at least for the time that you're in it and that can be really powerful and interesting and scary and beautiful um is it yeah. is it true <laughs> is it true michelle that some folks have used psychedelics i don't know about magic mushrooms but maybe ayahuasca or ketamine to to say to sort of get themselves out of their heads and maybe like quit smoking or stop a toxic trait that they're doing or rekindle a relationship with a loved one like is that sort of a lot of the I guess the I guess not actual medicinal in terms of a health effect but in terms of cutting out a bad habit I've sort of read some stuff about psychedelics being a tool to utilize in terms of exactly what you express quite eloquent eloquently of getting your self getting your mind to look at your body and your person and your soul and your being in an objective view and be like, oh, you're, you're being a jerk in this way, or you're 
you're wasting your life. You're going to die because you smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. Like, is that sort of a larger, has that always been connected with psychedelics? Is that sort of a newer thing? Am I totally out in left field? Am I totally incorrect? No, you're, this? you're, you're on to something for sure. I think that that has, I don't think that that's a new thing. I think it's a new thing we're talking about in the media as a way to destigmatize and change people's minds about psychedelics. But I do think this is definitely something they've like always been doing it could just be our modern context like that's what the mushrooms are showing us because that's what we're looking for but well the main thing that came to me when you were talking is um the power of intention essentially so folks who want to do this so well there's two camps actually so like first of all yes to answer your question um that often happens you know you could go in without an intention but just to like wanting to look at yourself and have like you know, a kind of internal mushroom or any kind of psychedelic experience and things like that might come up. But if you're really struggling to quit smoking or you actually have something that you know that you're stuck with, that you want to try to use this as a tool to help you out, then then yeah, then that's where the power of intention comes in. And a lot of folks who do this in a more therapeutic or spiritual context um, are really, you know, setting an intention before their journey is a really, really big, important part of how they use psychedelics, for, especially for self-growth and, and this kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, there's no promise. Like if you're a heavy smoker, you're like, all right, this weekend I'm going to eat an eighth of mushrooms and on Monday I'm going to be quit. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. But if you're a heavy smoker and you've been trying everything and like, yeah, you could go in with a really strong intention and and the mushrooms might show you like things you might not want to look at. Like, well, you smoke a lot because of this like trauma or something, you know, something that you're trying to ignore or like some part of you that actually needs work on before the quitting of the cigarette is going to be, it'll be easier if you deal with the death of your father when you were seven, like, you know, or something like, and that's why it can be hard and heavy. And sometimes folks want a guide or, or some kind of therapeutic support afterwards, which is another whole world we can talk about, which is this kind of like psychedelic integration. Um, and there's like coaches and therapists and things that'll help you with that. And you can do it on your own as well. But like, yeah. So it's, if there's something you really want to work on, you go into a psychedelic trip, you plan it out, you make it chill and calm and nice and you set an intention. There's a good chance, you know, you'll come out of that with your intention filled, but also not, it's like not a you know, there's no statistic that says, oh, well, 70% of people who do it come out quit. Like, I don't know. It really, it depends on you and how strong your resolve is too. Okay. So another potential myth, or is this true? Psilocybin, <laughs> Michelle, is an addictive substance or could be considered a gateway drug to other maybe more harmful substances. Is that true or false? Or maybe half of it's true, half of it's false. <laughs> Well, I mean, I really don't think psilocybin is addictive, A, eh? not compulsory like alcohol or even cannabis or like cocaine, meth, all these more traditionally like addictive substances. There's no like um, a withdrawal if you're eating mushrooms every day and then you stop. Like it's not going to be like, oh, I can't eat. Oh, I'm sweaty. I can't sleep. Like whatever. No. But the other thing is like if you're – taking a full dose and having a full mushroom experience, the average person, this is not everyone, but the average person finds that very powerful and like doesn't want to go back in for like months, years. Maybe that's the only trip they take. Like I haven't had a trip since March, even though I'm like a famous mushroom person. Like I had a really big trip and I'm still just like, I don't need that right now. It's a really big thing. I don't know. Um, That said, I mean, if you deal with addiction, so like, it's tricky. Like, I don't, I, you know, I'm not an addiction counselor. Some folks, like what I have heard is, so there's also like communities of people in recovery from addiction that want to use psychedelics to help them in their recovery process. And I did a feature article about those kinds of people. And I interviewed this guy um, and he told me that essentially like, it's, it's really tricky because like when he breaks his sobriety 
doesn't matter what substance, doesn't matter if it's iboga for healing his trauma, like the fact that he broke it, it makes him just want to like break it again with his problematic substance, which was opioids. So that's like, you know, you need a lot of emotional support if that's a route you're going to go down. But I really don't consider mushrooms addictive. Uh, they're not even like if you look at the data. However, this whole microdosing movement, too, there could be an argue for people doing that too much upping their dose to feel it because their tolerance and then they are like low level tripping every day. So I don't know. I think we're going to learn a lot about that. The other thing is there's not a lot of research on this. So it's not like we can refer to studies on this because no one's been doing them because doing studies on class A or schedule one substances is really difficult. And then what was the other part of the question? Oh, gateway drug. Okay. So what I will say is that if you've never done psychedelics and you have one really big, strong mushroom trip, the chances are it's going to be a gateway to maybe trying other psychedelics. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. As long as you do it responsibly, you know, you're still going to work, you're still picking your kids up from school. Like, I don't care what you do then. You're not in harming anyone else. Like, who cares, really? But that's like just my opinion on these things. You're probably going to get into like yoga and veganism or something. I bet it's like more of a gateway drug to like, I don't know, those kinds of like crystals and stuff. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right. I'm a fan of the veeganism. So maybe that's no harm, like no yeah. diss on veganism or crystals. No, actually. no, I'm I'm <laughs> a vegan myself. So <laughs> I'm a fan. Okay. Um, okay. So what about, is there, as far as you know, Michelle, are there any... Is there any market in terms of like tourism for psychedelics? As from what I've heard, there is. Does that exist more for mushrooms? Because I think maybe mushrooms are a little bit more easier to come by in, in countries like Canada or the US. Or like I, I've heard of stories of folks going to places, maybe to Central America or to Mexico and trying different substances. And there's a growing tourism around this. It's probably not legal necessarily, but is that kind of a growing market? Is that something you're familiar with? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it started more with ayahuasca in like Peru and Colombia, South America. Um, but, you know, here in Mexico, especially with mushrooms, because Mex uh, Mexico is like where mushrooms are from or where it still exists. And so there's definitely like, it's not big, but there is tourism. There's also retreat centers. So that, so that adds to the tourism world. They're not really legal here in Mexico, but I think they are in like Jamaica. And there's like a few countries where it's not so much that mushrooms have been legalized, but they were like never illegalized. And so they exist in this kind of like gray area. Same with like some newer psychedelics. Like there's this, the toad 5-MAO DMT, like in Mexico, it was never made illegal. So there are retreat centers for that. Like there's one in Tepetzlan outside of Mexico City that I've heard of. Um, folks who come, like if you want to come to Mexico for mushroom tourism, there's a little town in between Oaxaca City and the Oaxacan coast called San Jose del Pacifico, where it was kind of more of like the hippies who settled there and the mushrooms grew in the mountains there and this kind of mushroom tourism now exists. The town, San Jose, is like very mushroomy. It's cute. It's very small. You know, people sell mushroom tea and stuff out of their hostels. They grow mushrooms. Some people do ceremonies. Um, it's like a mix of kind of like indigenous Zapotec ceremonies and just kind of like modern tourism for hippies and Americans and stuff and Mexicans who want to go experience mushrooms in a beautiful place because um, you're in the mountains there. So a lot of the cabins are like perched on the mountain. They have this epic view of just like the other mountains in the clouds and you know, so yeah, it definitely exists. Um, it's small still. It's not like weed or beer where you can go and every day you could do a different tour and try a new strain. Like you go and you have one mushroom ceremony. It's probably all you can handle or want to do. And, you know, then you move on. Um, yeah. <laughs> Michelle, are mushrooms still the substance that you find the most interesting to potentially research and write about and experiment with? Or potentially are we going to see a, another 
companion book coming out from you in the near future? I don't think I'm going to write another companion, but I am personally not so much in my use, but more in my research, really interested in DMT. I find it really fascinating. There was this new study that just came out of um, England where they gave people infusions of DMT for 30 minutes instead of having them smoke it. So more like an IV drip. And they had these crazy experiences and um, they meet like entities. I'm really obsessed with aliens and UFOs. Um, and I feel like there's a connection there that I just like to kind of just read about. It's not really, I'm not even really focusing in too much on my work. It's more just a hobby <laughs> interest. Michelle, um, what what is, I've heard of this substance, but I'm not very familiar with it. What is DMT? Yeah. Um, it's the psychedelic, like the main psychedelic active ingredient in ayahuasca, but you can't just swallow DMT. You need to like combine it with another type of um, my, my chemistry is failing me at the moment, but like ayahuasca is a combination of DMT and harmaline or like other substances that like activate it, but you can smoke it. And when you smoke it, it's like this really quick five, 10, 15 minute crazy trip. You're like not yourself at all anymore. Not like mushrooms. You, you're gone for like five, 10 minutes and it's crazy, um, and then you come back and you're like, what the fuck is real? So that's, there's like a lot of Reddit. I like more reading like trip reports on like Reddit and, you know, Arrowhead and these kinds of, um, message boards of folks to share like anonymously. Cause there's all these like similarities between people's experiences. So like, what if they are actually blasting off to alien worlds? I don't know. That's just me. <laughs> is that a connection? Like when people... Yeah, Try that's a thing. Experiment. Yeah, it's a thing people talk about. Yeah, yeah, you, it's definitely you, a thing. You travel intergalactically. Perhaps interdimensionally, mm -hmm. perhaps. Interdimensional. Who knows? <laughs> that's wild. But is DMT exclusive? You said it's principally found in ayahuasca, but is there are there other substances that one can find DMT? In? Um. Yeah, DMT is actually in a lot of plants. Um. It's in like a root um it's in this 5-MAO it's a type of DMT is in the the Sonoroan toad so that's like the toad DMT like Mike Tyson's really into it you can watch YouTube videos of him talking about it um but yeah it's found in a bunch of different plants around the world you just have to like extract it you can't just like eat that root you have to do a little like kitchen chemistry I think Hamilton Morris has all these videos of him like extracting DMT if you're all interested um, and it's also perhaps, I don't know if this has been proven, but there are theories like Rick Strassman is really into this theory. He's a scientist and writer in psychedelic space that the body, the human body and the mammalian brain releases endogenous DMT, um, perhaps right before we die. So it might be connected to near death experiences, um, but yeah, I'm not sure if that's like, that might still be a theory. I don't know if that's proven, but that's really interesting that the human brain also makes it because it is batshit crazy. <laughs> uh, excuse my language. <laughs> no, I believe you. Yeah, that DMT sounds a little more intense. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. Where mushrooms, you know, if you're curious and you're listening to this, this DMT is just my personal little side project obsession, but mushrooms, you know, I think a lot of folks are really scared to lose control with psychedelics, but with mushrooms, you know, in the, you know, normal dose range, less than three, five grams, which is still quite high, honestly, um, you're still yourself, you know, you're, you're, you feel different, but you're always still you, you don't totally lose your, you don't go anywhere, you don't lose yourself. I think a lot of people are afraid of that. They're going to come back different, but not in a good way, things like that. And it's really not like that. It can, you know, it can be big and a little scary, but, you know, it can also be really beautiful and you can really learn a lot about yourself. Um, but yeah, I don't think that folks should be too scared about losing control because yeah, you are essentially still always you with mushrooms. <laughs> 
<laughs> and would you say, Michelle, if someone's interested in psychedelics, that mushrooms definitely are the first step to take or potentially there's another psychedelic that is equal to in terms of its intensity or it's yeah let's stick with intensity that would be a good choice for individuals who are interested in experimentation i definitely think mushrooms are the most popular choice they can be really subtle in low dose ranges not even microdose you know just half a gram one gram 1.5 it's not super overwhelming and then you can kind of work your way up to bigger doses, which are, you know, more powerful, potentially spiritual, potentially changing in some way. I think I wrote an article about first time psychedelics and like how to think about different ones. And it's on the Internet somewhere, <laughs> maybe on my website. I think another popular one, if you're not trying to do this illegally in your bedroom, is the ketamine clinics are really popular right now, especially if you're dealing with treatment resistant depression. You know, you can go do ketamine um, in an infusion clinic and it's often even covered by insurance and things. And, and it's been helping a lot of folks get out of ruts and get over treatment resistant depression. Some folks like ayahuasca, the whole ceremonial group aspect and traveling to a foreign place and, you know, just do your homework, make sure everything's safe is, is you know, make sure you feel really safe and comfortable, I think is the most important thing. And then from there, you know, dose and intention and these other bits um, can really help you have, you know, an important journey. Very interesting. Well, Michelle, we're coming up on our hour mark, so I want to be respectful of your time, of course. But I guess maybe I'll end with a final question of I asked if you would have another companion book coming out. Um, I guess the answer was Maybe, probably not, but are there any other projects you're working on? You have interests in DMT and other things. Are there any publications you're potentially thinking of or where folks could find maybe articles you're writing? What's in the near future for Michelle? Yeah, no, thanks for asking. Um, So actually, in my free time, I've been working on a novel, which isn't going to come out for a really long time if it ever comes out. Um, and part of the plot um, is exploring um, DMT, the contact aliens. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to write like a sci-fi thriller, mystery thriller about that concept. So um, I'm I'm actually um, just sent my first pages off to my writers group. So I have my first critique next week. So we'll see if I'll be pursuing this idea or not. No, I'm really excited. You know, I've always wanted to write a novel. I'm a big reader. It's how I got really interested in becoming a writer. So it's kind of this pipe dream I've been working on more as a hobby on the side. But if folks are interested in reading any of my past work on, you know, safe psychedelic use and all these kinds of the research and big questions in this space, um, I think every article I've ever written is on my personal website, michellejanikian.com, under articles. So you can go through the archives there. <laughs> All right. We'll be sure to post that URL in the description for this episode. Michelle Janikian, journalist and author of your Psilocybin Mushroom Companion. We greatly appreciate all your insight, your knowledge, your experience, your wisdom, so thank you very much for joining us, Michelle, and hopefully we can chat again soon. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer-related content. Remember, craft beer is here.